Congressman Steve Stivers on the tone in Washington and health care. Month after month, year after year, the political rhetoric around the country has continued to get hotter. This week, it boiled over when a man, apparently fueled by his deep opposition to President Trump, opened fire on a Republican congressman practicing at a baseball, practicing for a baseball game. Representative Steve Scalise of Louisiana was critically wounded. Four others were shot. Capitol Police security detail uh, shot and killed the suspect. The shocking violence has prompted heartfelt words of bipartisanship in Washington. And here to talk about that and other big issues is Congressman Steve Stivers, Republican of Upper Arlington. Congressman, what's the last few days in Washington been like? Well, it was uh, very shocking and obviously, uh, you know, people did not see this coming. Um, uh Congressman Steve Stivers on the tone in Washington and health care. <music> month after month, year after year, the political rhetoric around the country has continued to get hotter. This week it boiled over when a man, apparently fueled by his deep opposition to President Trump, opened fire on a Republican congressman practicing at a baseball, practicing for a baseball game. Representative Steve Scalise of Louisiana was critically wounded. Four others were shot. Capitol Police security detail uh, shot and killed the suspect. The shocking violence has prompted heartfelt words of bipartisanship in Washington. And here to talk about that and other big issues is Congressman Steve Stivers, Republican of Upper Arlington. Congressman, what's the last few days in Washington been like? Well, it was uh, very shocking and obviously, uh, you know, people did not see this coming. Um, uh, I do believe that the tone of the rhetoric uh, has driven people uh, to the extremes and gotten them more excited and incited. And uh, I think we need to turn the volume down on the rhetoric. And uh, it's okay to debate issues. It's okay to disagree, but we need to not vilify each other and we need to, to make sure that we all um, understand that we share humanity together and that we, uh, everybody comes with a perspective, but nobody's, no other political group is evil. They just might be wrong, but they're not evil. We heard this before. Now, the, the congressman, Congresswoman Gabby Gifford shooting was not politically motivated. That was not the prime motivation on that. It was more of a, a mental health issue with, with that assailant. But we heard this talk of coming together in unity and bipartisanship, and it didn't last then. Will it last now? I don't know, uh, but I think we all need to look in the mirror and say, what can I do to make things better? I think elected officials need to look in the mirror. Mike, I think the media needs to look in the mirror. I can tell you as somebody who doesn't say a lot of outrageous things, I find myself doing a lot of pre-interviews for um, national TV, but uh, don't always uh, don't make get to go on. I don't make the cut because they want people to say outrageous things. And uh, so the media has a role. but. But individual elected officials bear responsibility for the things they say that turn the rhetoric up and turn the heat up. And, and we all need to think about that. Um, but I hope we'll all look in the mirror and say, what can we do to make civil society work better and make our debates be uh, more about the issues and you know, how we can find resolution of the issues than about attacking each other. And it happens too frequently in Washington and on cable news. And we well, all a, have some responsibility. You're in a position where you could possibly influence this because the rhetoric really gets turned up 
in campaigns. And you are the head of the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee. So you're in charge of recruiting candidates and helping, recruiting Republican candidates and helping Republican incumbents get reelected. Is there anything you can do as chair to say, look, let's cool it on the negative ads, or let's keep the negative ads, the critical ads, within a certain boundary? Yep. I think there might be, and I, you know, we're obviously uh, talking about that. This week there have been a lot of conversations, and uh, in my role as chairman of the National Republican Congressional Committee, we've had a lot of conversations about campaign rhetoric and campaign ads and uh, how we can you know, draw important contrasts that the voters need without vilifying our opponents and um, you know, attacking them personally. And so it, it's obviously a, a fine line, but it's important. And uh, we're having those conversations. So I do think uh, I'm in a position where I might be able to influence things and I'm gonna try to make them better. You have a high profile position in Washington, but you do not have a security detail. Do you need one? I, I'm not sure. I, I uh, you know, I have a lot of training myself, but I uh, try to make sure that I uh, keep myself safe and keep my family safe and keep my constituents safe when they're in meetings with me. Mm -hmm. So we do uh, have a lot of security protocols, but I don't have a 24 seven uh, security detail with me. So, um, you know, that it, just is what it is, and I, I try to make sure that I keep my staff safe, my constituents safe, and obviously my family safe, uh, no matter what's going on. The uh, weapon used in this case apparently, reportedly, was a was a rifle, high power rifle, military style, but not a classic assault rifle. Same gun apparently used in the shooting of those five Dallas police officers. Should that gun be? accessible to folks who have mental health problems, which this man may have had. Well, this man bought the uh, weapons. He also had a nine millimeter pistol. Mm -hmm. He bought his weapons legally, at least I've seen those media reports. Um, and, um, you know, he may have had a mental health problem, but it was not a diagnosed mental health problem. So, um, and I do believe that this gentleman had a mental health problem because people that don't have mental health problems don't go around shooting people they don't know. He uh, seemed suicidal, getting so affairs in order before he left. Certainly, yeah. uh, he was doing things that make you think he had mental health and suicidal tendency uh, issues. So, uh, you know, but the no investigation more, continues. Yeah. But I think the thing where we can make a difference is really around mental health. If you look at these shootings, wherever they are, the common component is really a mental health issue. And we have a mental health crisis in this country that's going untreated or undertreated, and it's something that, that we have to address. And I think that's a, a great segue to um, some things we need to do in unfinished business in healthcare reform. Uh, and I hope we all think about that as we're going through health care reform, Mike. We'll get to health care in a moment. President Trump, of course, he now admits that he is under investigation, according to his Twitter feed on Friday morning. He says he did not ask former FBI Director Comey to at, for his loyalty and did not ask him that he hoped that the Michael Flynn investigation would go away. Comey says he did. The president did say those things. So one man is lying. Which man do you believe? Well, we'll find out. We're gonna, I believe in the House Intelligence Committee's investigation. Uh, by the way, it's the one that's happening um, not all with TV cameras on, which I think is probably a better way to do this. I also support uh, uh, Director Mueller for the former director of the FBI's special investigation that he is taking. Uh, and I wanna let those investigations conclude, look at all the evidence instead of looking at piecemeal parts of the evidence, because that's not what we do. We should look at the whole uh, investigation and the conclusion of the investigation and then figure out a way forward. And there will, I think, be an obvious way forward when we look at Director Mueller's investigation as well as the investigation of the House Intelligence Committee. If, if that evidence shows in a somewhat clear fashion that the president did try to obstruct justice, would a Republican House vote to impeach him? I think we will do our job, but I'm not gonna get into hypotheticals mm -hmm. of what that is. We need to let the investigation conclude, but I have every confidence that the House will do its job um, and let the facts lead us where it needs to go and take whatever action we need to take based on the facts. Mm -hmm. Do you get tired of answering questions about Donald Trump? Uh, you know, I, he, the president seems to suck a lot of oxygen out of the room through the campaign and, and to today. Uh, I'd clearly rather talk about the issues of the day. You know, we have to get people back to work. We've got to build our infrastructure. 
We need to reform our tax code. Uh, I'd rather talk about those things, but we talk about what uh, what's on the people's mind. One of those things is health care. Uh, President Trump had a big celebration on the, on the Rose Garden, praising the bill that you voted for, the House passed uh, health care bill. Now he says it's mean. Is the bill you voted for mean? Well, I think uh, the bill that we voted for was a good first step. And in the time we had, we did the best we could. There are things we need to do to fix the House passed bill. Um, 700,000 Ohioans get their insurance now through Medicaid expansion. I support Medicaid expansion, but it's important to understand what Medicaid expansion is doing to people uh, that have insurance through it. Uh, they are limited to getting a job at 130% of poverty. It's like a big wet blanket over top of their economic opportunity. We need to build a path out of um, Medicaid expansion for these people. And it's pretty easy to do. It's like what we did for people with disabilities that I sponsored when I was a state senator. It's called Medicaid buy-in. It lets people, as they make a little more, pay a little more, but it allows them to keep their insurance as they grow their economic opportunity and hopefully get to a point where they have employer-sponsored health care. Uh, well, I also be, think we've yeah. got more work to do on pre-existing conditions. So I, you know, there was a last minute amendment mm -hmm. and I'm sure that may be what the president's talking about that uh, wasn't perfect, but it attempted to make health care affordable for people that are healthy. And uh, you know, we have uh, two problems in health care. We have to figure out how to pay for health care for people who are sick and make health care affordable for people who are healthy but could become sick. One way and to make so it affordable we can is make to, it better. One way to make it affordable is to is to put a cap on health care costs somehow. Do would you support any kind of because the President Obama's health care bill did not really put a cap on health care costs. We've never that, done a very good job of capping health care costs. I'm I'm not sure there's an easy way to cap health care costs, but I will tell you, Mike, I believe the best way to transform health care is to encourage our citizens to be to shop for health care the same way they shop for everything else. Would you support, because the Senate has to vote and then it comes back to the House and you'll likely have to vote again, yep. um, what, will you support a bill that does not insure as many people that have insurance today? Uh, you know, the bill I voted for, the CBO says some people may choose million. not to buy insurance and others will lose insurance. Uh, what I want to do is make our health care system work better. I need it. I want it to become more affordable. By the way, m the most people of that 24 million, 23 million people uh, that the CBO says won't have insurance anymore are people that choose not to buy it anymore because they're not required to buy it anymore. We do have to figure out how to deal with catastrophic health care issues which can be a problem where if I have catastrophic health care issues and don't have insurance, then I'm causing a burden on the whole system. A lot of those folks but aren't choosing to buy it because they can't afford it. I think that nobody wants to risk their whole house in the future because, because of an illness if they and, and that is the biggest problem is we have to get to affordability. Affordability, if we have a crisis in health care in this country, it's a crisis of affordability. The House bill attempted to get at affordability. We might be able to do things better. I'm looking forward to seeing what the Senate's answer is. And I've always said the House bill was a good first step. I didn't claim it was perfect. I want it to get better. I want it to get better for people that uh, have insurance to help them be able to afford to keep insurance. Okay. Um, and, but I want to make sure we make insurance more affordable at the same time. So we've got work to do, and I'm anxious to see what the Senate bill looks like and, and hope that they can make it better because the American people um, deserve a chance to get affordable health care that they can access if they ever get sick. All right, and we it. all want that. Thanks to Congressman Steve Stivers from Burlington. Thanks for joining us here on Columbus on the Record. Next up, the Columbus on the Record panel. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Julie Carr Smythe, State House Correspondent for the Associated Press. Chrissy Thompson, Columbus Bureau Chief for the Cincinnati Inquirer. Sam Gresham of Common Cause Ohio, and Mike Gonadakis, Republican strategist. The Ohio Senate did what Governor Kasich and the Ohio House could not do. It balanced the upcoming two-year state budget. 
The task was left to the Senate because tax revenues continue to come in below expectations, meaning there will be less money than expected the next two years to spend on things like education and health care. The Senate plan does not cut or raise taxes, but it cuts spending 3 to 4 percent across the board. And it cuts Medicaid spending, but it adds money for the fight against the opioid epidemic. Chrissy Thompson, you know, the unemployment rate in the state is under 5 percent. We see construction going on everywhere. There are cranes popping up all over, at least central Ohio. People think the economy is recovering. Why can't the state pay its bills? Well, there's two reasons. I mean, just most basically, our state recovery is is slow and continues to be slower than anyone thought it would be. We have growth in our state, but it's slow, and it, this has been an issue for, for years. So Ohio, um, because of its population issues, its age issues, uh, its, its makeup, uh, historical reliance on manufacturing, we've been a slow growing economy and, and have continued to be. Um, more specifically, it looks like we've gotten some new numbers um, and it, it looks like uh, our wages have been growing slowly but um, below the national average, but the national average of, wage, uh, of, of wages actually has fallen. Um, and we just got new numbers on that recently. And so it looks like uh, no, that's only happened, I think, eight quarters um, since they've been keeping track. And so that kind of has thrown off a lot of the forecasts, including in Ohio. So, Julie, where, who will feel the brunt of, will the average Ohioan feel the effects of a 3 to 4 percent budget cut across the board among state, state agencies? Um, well, certainly they will in terms of uh, how uh, this tax hole has to be filled because even though we are seeing that they have managed to balance the budget, they've done so in some ways with, with a few little tricks, um, things like pulling a little bit of money out of the rainy day fund or moving certain things out of what we call the GRF, the general revenue fund, into, and funding them with federal uh, money, that kind of thing. So, you know, they're, the schools, uh, they've tried to protect at least some of the school districts. I think 535 of the school districts have uh, been maintained, but some of them are going to see um, some, some of them some are going to see there. reductions, and mm -hmm. uh, it's just uh, various things that it's difficult for people to, um, you know, quantify right now. Is this a responsible budget? 100 percent fiscally responsible because we we cut we closed a one billion dollar hole. It's fact, black and white, but yet we still kept those core services for the vulnerable for Medicaid, we're 176 million the Senate's proposing for uh, the drug problem we have in our country. As Julie said, 535 of the 615 school districts are gonna see same or increase um, in school funding from 2017. So at the end of the day, your question was, will the average Ohioan feel any pain? No, they won't. Three to 4% cut in bureaucracy is easy. But the $200 million cut to Medicaid, mm -hmm. $75 million to hospitals, they're not too happy about this. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we'll see how that actually impacts people, but if we can save it through efficiencies and make up through it through doing things better, I think we'll be okay. I, I don't think we're going to see uh, any changes or any problems whatsoever. I totally disagree. Of course. I think the budget is going to cause a whole lot of problems, particularly for schools and transportation. Now, you ask yourself, how did we get this hole? Uh, for the last, uh, since 2000, we've given away $8 billion in tax cuts to people. If you want to look at it, we, we've given it away. The, the proposition was that you, you're going to invest this money and we're going to get returns in jobs. The statistics doesn't prove that we've gotten returns in jobs. In fact, it proves the, a difference. We've got a, a big hole that we put all this money into in a trickle-down theory that has failed. Here's the problem, Mike. He says we gave away $8 billion. We gave it back to the people who went to work and made it. So the $8 billion tax cut or, or whatever the number is, it's your money. It's your paycheck. It's your paycheck. It's our money. The government, it, it's not the government's money. It's my money. It's your money, Sam. Whether you want it or not, it's still your money. Aren't we, all in, this, aren't we all in this thing together? 100% we are. Well, let's get to that tax cut. The budget process would be easier if lawmakers would do one simple thing, and that's eliminate a small business tax deduction that is costing the state about a billion dollars a year. This tax cut passed in 2013, was renewed in 2015. It's kind of complicated, but it basically allows the owners of small businesses to pay zero income taxes on the first $250,000 of business income. It's a decent sized deduction, like $1,000 to $15,000 or so, but that's not enough to, for an accountant to hire an assistant. So many Democrats and even some conservatives say it is time to scrap it. 
Julie Carr Smythe, the reporting on this is that this tax cut, this deduction, has not created jobs as promised. Why aren't, re why aren't Republican lawmakers looking to scrap the tax cut? Well, I mean, the basic uh, premise of the of the cut is that it is supporting uh, supporting the attractiveness of the state to a business interests and that kind of thing. You know, what some of the reporting has found, however, is uh, I know that the dispatch had a, a, um, an investigation that saw about half of state lawmakers themselves benefit from this particular tax uh, break. We don't know that they took it, but they would be eligible based on the type of businesses that they have listed on their financial disclosure. So um, that does not mean necessarily, uh, in all fairness, that it's self-interest as much as it's the way in which we all <laughs> know the people around us are like us. And the people who we've elected are around a lot of other people who are in this same kind of business configuration. Mike, this was sold as a tax cut that would create jobs. Mm -hmm. It really hasn't. Should we keep it? Um, I think it has, and here's why, Mike. We have a consumer-oriented economy. Just look at Polaris and Ikea now and all this booming consumerism, Easton and shopping centers all across the country. When you have more money, you spend more money on your family, at restaurants, at buying. That's not how it was sold. It was sold that small businesses could take this deduction and hire more people for their business. And they're not doing Well, whether that happened or not, here's the bottom line. Our economy is based on people going out to the mall, going shopping, going out to eat, spending their dollars, whether it be on Amazon or what have you. Um, and it's, that's happening because they have more money in their pocket today. The, the, the facts are, since um, uh, 2012, 2013, employment has been down in comparison to those years by 29%. So that says that we're not producing the jobs. Now, if you want to know, the Office of Bannon and Budget said the other tax breaks we approved by the General Assembly will cost us $11 million. So. We're, we're putting money into this rat hole with this trickle-down theory that we're going to magically something's going to happen. You know, that's called insanity. You're doing something and you repeat it, expecting something to happen. Chrissy, Kansas went farther down this road than Ohio has, and now they're pulling back because they have a deeper financial hole than Ohio has. Is there any talk at the State House? of doing what Kansas did and repealing some of these things, or at least not renewing this deduction. So I, I suppose you might be talking about this this time next week because um, we're still waiting for a final number from the state, which we'll get uh, late next week, that says really how much money you're going to have for the budget. They've been using projections, and they'll, they'll do one more update. It is possible if there's some drastic adjustment that maybe that might go on the table, but I think it's important that this is just a difference in philosophy. and um, and. Because we don't have as, Kansas did a lot of things differently than what we did in Ohio. For one, they counted on making, uh, creating a certain number of jobs that Ohio um, didn't fit that into their uh, forecast uh, for, for the economy. And so um, we, we are uh, still, still able to adjust the budget with just a couple percentage points. And so anyway, it, I, I really don't see there being some huge gap that they have to cover. So Ohio didn't overpromise like Kansas perhaps did. No, and they still, you know, the leaders generally still believe that that was this tax cut was the right move and they can the, ba the bottom line is they can balance the budget without giving the money back. And so since Republicans are in charge, that's what they're going to do. Hmm. We'll wrap up this week's show where we started the effect of this week's shooting in Washington and talk of trying to bridge the political divide. Mike on you're probably the of the people at this table, the most partisan, a self-described homer for Republicans, you say. <coughs> um, you certainly have never, ever advocated violence. It's always been no, very I civil. But you're, you're pointed in your criticism in your Twitter feed. Did the, did the shooting give you pause before you sent out a tweet this week about, you know, political stuff? No, because I think there's a level of discourse that you can be professional and I can disagree with Sam on any given basis or, or issue and still have respect for him and be kind to him and treat him as a human being. But at the end of the day, what happened with the tragedy that happened? It was an act of political violence. We have a climate of hate that's being perpetrated by the Democrats. Hillary Clinton creates Wait a this now, resistance. Republicans have not done the same thing. Okay. Some Republicans have done the same thing. Not elected leaders, but advocates for Republicans when Obama was off. Okay. It's a two-way street, correct? We are, it is. We are in the here and now. Yeah. Okay. Hillary creates the resist pack. Kathy Gifford holds up a head, a bloody head of, of the president of the United States. We have a play in New York City where they, they, they glamorize killing the president. When is this going to stop? They had that same play with Barack Obama, Barack Obama. As, the, as the character, and they had pictures of him with a noose. Is, doesn't yeah. this go both ways, Mike? That's it, what I'm asking. It does. In recent past 48, 72 hours, it doesn't, but... It, 
but Longer again, being in the here and now, we have to address what's in front of us, okay? Yeah, but we that's can't not unwind true. the clock. That's not true. And not that it justifies it, and we can't unwind These the clock. These tribes, called the Democrats and Republicans, are at war with each other. And they're at war with each other with a model which is a zero-sum game. We, ha we control the House, we control the Senate, we control the White House, and we do whatever the heck we want. And that's been the model that we want, that, that democracy has diminished. We don't have compromise. We don't have friends. I have to eviscerate a Democrat. I can't be seen with a Republican. You know, this is, this is hard line. This is like gangs, if you understand gangs, and I understand and this, gangs. And this happened during the, at least the first two years of the Obama administration. Right. They got the power and they didn't want to compromise. Right. And, and that's how they play. Well, and it used to be um, in politics, you know, the election season would pass and there would be this period of calm upon which everybody went back to their work and they discussed policy and um, it just doesn't happen anymore. It is literally the very next day that the, you know, the consultants and the, the what's the next political calculation for that right. politician starts. And um, I know that uh, Representative Stivers mentioned you know, the media plays into this as well, and it made me think, I mean, I'm, I'm a reporter who uh, oftentimes, I'm not a gotcha reporter. I'm a reporter who, if somebody makes a misstatement, very often I call them back and say, I don't think that's what you meant to say. I mean, I don't think all journalists are that way, and that's another part of the hyperbole that's going on. I think the body slam crystallized this whole problem. We called the, the Congress, congressional candidate who... Right, attacked. how he reacted, and the visceral this is just under the surface and, and at any moment it will bubble up and something will go wrong well, happened this week let's get to our off the record parting shots and mike ladakis we'll start with you Ohio has spent hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars over the past 30 years on anti-tobacco smoking cessation programs the dispatch just recently reported that we are 43rd out of 50 um, in smoking related wellness so we've spent all this money no results i that's a lesson to be learned is you can throw all the money you want at the drug problem opioids oxycontin what have you and it doesn't mean it's going to solve the problem Sam. I think the discourse that we are enjoying now in the Congress will not go away. In fact, it will intensify as we get close to the 2018 and the 2020 election. The 2020 election is going to be the election of all time because Trump is running for re-election. I don't think it's going to dissipate. I think it's going to get worse. Chrissy. I don't necessarily disagree with Sam. I think we have a very short window where all of these uh, uh, political leaders who've been saying, hey, there's a lot of unity. We have a lot of headlines right now saying that there's unity, a lot of, a lot of photo ops, but I think the American people, I know at least I'm waiting to see some actual evidence of this, and they have a very short window to actually work together and do something uh, that, that proves that they really are doing that. And Joy. Um, uh, governor Kasich, on a policy matter, has, has signed on to a letter with some other governors that says we shouldn't pass the House passed uh, health care bill but that we should work on fixing Obamacare. And he's uh, in a bipartisan group, speaking of that, to have tried to do something with that, and that'll be an interesting one to watch. That would be a put your money where your mouth is <laughs> if, if both parties could sit down and have a bipartisan agreement on health care to, to say we're willing to work together, but we'll see. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online, Facebook, Twitter, and you can see every episode if you miss us at our website, WOSU.org. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.